So we're going to look at homogeneous ODEs with constant coefficients. So here was a homogeneous, and homogeneous also means linear. Uh, now if it's constant coefficients, what that means is all these functions, all these f's are constants. They're just numbers. So that's the first type of homogeneous uh, ODE we're going to look at. <coughs> and again, homogeneous means linear. So all of our f k's are constants. And what we're going to do then is just write them as a k's. So if this will just be constants. So our f k's of x are just going to be constants. We'll just write them as a k's. So our o d e. This is the ODE from that last page of notes. So our high order term is n, so we got an yn derivative plus an minus 1 yn minus 1 derivative plus etc plus a1 y prime plus a0 y0 derivative equals 0. So all that really happened is the f's got replaced by a's, so they're just constants. Now we're going to suppose, of course, just like with polynomials, this is not an nth degree if the a n is 0. It would be a lower degree if your a n was 0. So we're assuming our a n is not 0. So your, if your leading term is 0, that's not really your leading term anymore. You would go down to the next term that was not zero and you would say it was that degree. So our leading coefficient is not zero. Now I'm going to do something strange. I'm going to suppose y equals e to the mx is a solution. So now what we're going to do is we're going to plug this in to the original. So we're going to plug in. We're going to use this original ODE right here at the top of the board quite a bit. So I'll label it with a double asterisk. So we're going to plug it into this asterisk asterisk equation. So what I need to do is figure out what is y prime, y double prime, all the way up to the nth derivative of y. So I need to compute. I'm about to plug it in everywhere we see y and y prime, all these derivatives. So I need to plug it into all these spots. So I need to find the derivatives. So what's the derivative of e to the mx? m e to the m x. It's e to the m x times derivative of m x, which is m. So this is our derivative right here. And of course I need the second derivative. So what's the derivative of m e to the m x? m squared to the, or m squared e to the m x. Yep, so we get basically every derivative we take, we're going to get another m out of here from the chain rule. And dot, 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 we're ready to write the nth derivative is m to the n power e to the mx. So you take n derivatives, you just keep getting the constant m multiplied out. And we're ready to plug in now. So this is a n m n e to the mx. So I'm plugging into that first, that's the first term right there, just replacing yn by what we just computed a second ago. And now I'm just going to go down the line, make all these subs. So we're going down to a1 m e m x 
plus a zero, just e to the mx, and this all equals zero. All right, so not exciting so far. What can I factor out? So I got e to the mx every single spot. That's the only thing that's in common. So I'm going to factor that out. Can e to the mx ever equal 0? That term we just factored out. No. That can never be zero. So I'm using the zero product property. What I just circled cannot equal zero, which means the other term has to equal zero. So I'll just write ZPP for the zero product property. So we already know that all the a's are constants. I don't know what m is, but what are we looking at here? All the a's are constants. So we got powers of m multiplied by constants added together, also known as polynomial. This is a polynomial in M right here that we're looking at. And M is the zero or the root of this polynomial. So P of M is this polynomial A N M to the N plus A N minus one M N minus one plus A one M plus A zero. So M is a root of this polynomial. So all we need to do is set this polynomial equal to zero and figure out what all the different m values are solutions. So this basically turns it into a pre-calculus one problem. We're going to use the zero product property and then we're going to uh, find a zero and then divide that factor and reduce the degree by one and then repeat that process. So we're going to look for zeros of polynomials. So this polynomial, PM, I'm going to write in summation notation. So this is AK, M to the K, K equals zero to N. And this is called the characteristic equation. Well, when you said it equals zero, it's called the characteristic equation. So there's a couple cases. Uh, your roots could be real and distinct, meaning there's no repeats. So we'll do that case first. That's kind of the easy one, where you get different roots. <clears throat> so real and distinct means no repeats. So in this case, solution solutions are y1 equals e to the m1x, y2 is e to the m2x, yn is e to the mnx. How did I know there's going to be m, uh, n solutions?
because basically our degree will be n. So in an nth degree uh, polynomial can have up to n solutions. Now I'm assuming they're all real. So that means uh, they can be written like this right here. So real numbers, uh, <coughs> there will be no more than n solutions. All right, so we're ready to solve an example. So we'll do y double prime plus, no, y triple prime plus 2y double prime minus y prime minus 2y equals 0. So the first thing we're going to do Let y equal e to the mx. And you don't need to compute all these derivatives. I'm just going to do it this first time. y prime is m e to the mx, y double prime, m squared e to the mx, y triple prime, m cubed e to the mx. And now we're going to plug all these in. So we get m cubed e to the mx plus 2m squared e to the mx minus m e to the mx minus 2 e to the mx equals 0. Any questions on plugging these values in, or these derivatives in? So now what we're going to do, we're factoring out e to the mx which I'm just going to cancel. So I'm going to factor it out and divide by e to the mx. So that has the effect of canceling it. And we get m cubed plus 2m squared minus m minus 2 equals 0. And if you want to write the algebra we just did, we multiply by 1 over e to the mx. That was how we eliminated it right there. Now it comes down to factoring this cubic. We need the rational zero theorem. So rational zero theorem says take uh, factors of the constant term divided by factors of the leading term. Factors of constant coefficient divided by factors of leading coefficient. So we have factors of 2 divided by factors of 1. So 2 has only two factors, 1 and 2. 1, it's a little silly, has exactly one factor, which is itself. So all combinations are 1 over 1 and 2 over 1, which we can reduce to 1 and 2. We also have to try plus and minus. So we're going to try plus and minus. And let's give this a name. We'll call it P of M. So I like to try these easiest to more difficult. So four possibilities. I'll test one right now, and then you can test the rest on your own. So p of one gives us one plus two minus one minus two, and that gives us zero. So plug in negative one, positive two, and negative two. So we're going to see if we can get any other zeros. We've got one already, so m equals one is a zero, but maybe we'll get uh, potentially two more here as well.
So we actually found all three roots right here, all three zeros with rational zero theorem. The only way you won't find the zero with the rational zero theorem is if the zero is not rational. So how can a zero not be rational? It's an irrational, so usually those are gonna have square roots. Or the other option is complex. And it's not a coincidence we just look at complex numbers because when they're complex solutions, we uh, will do something different. So we have <coughs> these different n values. Each one of these corresponds to a different solution. So our first solution is e to the negative 2x. All these solutions are y equals e to the mx. So there's three different m values. So our second solution is e to the negative x. And our third solution is e to the regular x. So any questions on the three solutions we got? You can test them out, but if you recall how we got here, we took some derivatives, and these should be the exact solutions to those derivatives. Maybe exact's the wrong word. These are already, we got these because they were solutions to uh, the differential equation. So how do you get those numbers in the, the curly brackets next to the two and the one? Is it just numbers that multiply into it? Or right here? Yeah. That's the rational zero theorem which says if there's a rational zero to a, a polynomial with integer coefficients that it's the numerator will be a factor of the constant coefficient and the denominator will be a factor of the leading coefficient and it is the rational zero theorem so your pre cal textbook will probably be the I think the only resource that I've used in class that has rational zero theorem in. everything inside the curly brackets are just factors of Two and one, right? Yep. So that's I factored two and I factored one. I mean, it's trivial to factor one, but a lot of times you'll have like a four or a six, something like this, and so you want to write down the you know three or four factors you get. Uh, when your denominator is one, it's trivial. Everything divided by ones itself, but a lot of times your denominator will be like one and it could be one or two or one or four or something like like that. So you need to try different combinations. So what did I say last section about linear, OD, linear homogeneous ODEs with different solutions? So let's look back at that theorem. They are linearly dependent. So, so first of all, did we have continuous functions? What type of functions did we have in our uh, problem that we just did? No, so the original coefficient functions not have nothing to do with our solutions. The original coefficient functions. Oh, just the, the m cubed and the m squared, the two m squared? They didn't have any m's in them. They were, let's see. They were constants, somewhere around here. This was the ODE. They all had constant coefficients. So constant functions are continuous. They're really boring. They're just horizontal lines, but they're all continuous. So we satisfy the hypothesis, which is a linear ODE with continuous uh, coefficient functions. Our functions are way better than just continuous, they're constant. It's the easiest type of continuous function. So I think we satisfy the hypothesis. So we had this homogeneous ODE, and we had a family, and we also showed that uh, before that E to different multiples of X are linearly independent. So we showed that earlier. So our solutions we got, there was three solutions, they were linearly independent. And now, the second part of this theorem, the linear combination is also a solution. So I'm allowed to add together linear combinations of those three solutions, and that will still give me a solution. So let's go back. So any linear combo of y1, y2, and y3 is also a solution. So I'm going to take the linear combination 
A1Y1, nope, don't want to use A's. Let's do C1Y1 plus C2Y2 plus C3Y3. So it's C1 E to the negative 2X plus C2 E to the negative X plus C3 E to the X. So this is our three parameter family of solutions. Why should I have expected three parameters, three constants, when I started with this differential equation? Because there's three derivatives. You basically get a constant for each derivative that you have. So we had three, so you're expecting three constants. So that should not be a surprise. So the good news is all the uh, I mean, these are the most trivial higher order ODEs, but these are very easy to solve. So I'm going to have you solve the next one right now. And this one will be a little bit easier. It's just degree two. So we've got y double prime minus 3y prime plus 2y equals zero. I'll scroll out. I want that top of the board says let y equal e to the mx. That's super important. That I'll highlight that right there. Let y equal e to the mx. So we need to do that exact same move right here. So we got a y prime and a y double prime we're going to need. So compute y prime, y double prime, and then take those and plug in. and then solve for m in the exact same way we just did. So do that right now. And it's a good time for questions if you have them. And go all the way with this. So I want to see your linear combination of your, how many solutions should you be expecting? Two. Two, same as the degree. You should have a linear combination of two exponential functions. And it's just a quadratic, so you shouldn't need the rational zero through one. So I skipped a step right here, which I don't recommend you do when you're beginning. I could skip this entire, I probably want to skip the very, very first line right there, but I'm very okay skipping the other two steps because these derivatives are so easy to compute right here. So hopefully this factors going to be two negatives, try two and one, and that does work out. Alright, so we get two or one, and so y1 is e to the 2x. The reason that I like to write this down in the upper left corner is because if I for some reason forget that, that's the exact form that I'm turning these into. So if you don't have that written down, uh, you're doing all, you're relying on your memory for quite a bit. So I'm directly using that form above. So I recommend you at least write that step down that I have. So our final uh, 
we call it the general, not the general. The end parameter family of linearly independent solutions is C1 e to the 2x plus C2 e to the x. And I would need two initial conditions to get rid of both constants. Uh, it came from basically that theorem that we looked at where linear combination of linearly independent solutions to a homogeneous ODE is still a solution. So that was the second point in 19.2, which we did prove yesterday. I mean, we did it in a quick way, but we did prove it that you're still, that linear combo is still a solution. So there's really nothing more to roots that are real and distinct. It's just e to that, whatever that root is, and that's all there is to it. So now we're going to look at repeated real roots. So this is labeled in the book as 20c. What is a lowest degree polynomial that can have a repeated root? So we can have a degree 2. You can, of course, have higher degrees, but we're going to look at the easiest example we can think of with repeated root. So we're going to suppose that, let's just make it really literal. We'll just say m equals 2. I'm just picking an m value is repeated twice. So if we just naively write our uh, y equals, and I'm just noticing in my notes, I wrote a subscript that I don't think is consistent with. So this linear combination, if you notice, there's a little sub c right there. So I'm going to write my linear combination as y sub c of x instead of just y of x. So I'll go back here. The only thing that really changes my linear combination solution is a y sub c, just c for combination. And I think I wrote above this just general solution should be y sub c. So we got our m is 2 is repeated twice, then we would get y equals c1 e to the 2x plus c2 e to the 2x. Easiest little bit of algebra lets me factor out e to the 2x. So are there really two constants here or is there really one constant? It's really one constant. So this is not going to work if we have repeated if we go with the same method, we're going to only have one of the two solutions. We're not going to get both. We're not going to get two distinct independent solutions. So what we're going to have to do is a little more work. So this is not linearly independent. What is a non-zero combination of C1 and C2 that makes this equal to zero? Well, if they're equal, then I would just get double C1. Equal and opposite. Of course, 0, 0 always works, but yeah, equal but opposite signs. So I think negative 1 and 1 is probably the easiest combination to see here. So C1 equals 1, C2 equals negative 1. So here's my non-zero combination that gives me 0. So there's my, uh, <coughs> you only need one uh, set of non-zero coefficients that make this zero. So all you need to do is show, hey, there exists one combination that gives me zero. All right, so it's clearly not linearly independent. All right, let's go.
go ahead and let's solve y double prime minus 2ay prime plus a squared y equals 0. All right, so solve this the way I showed you before. So assume y equals e to the mx, and then go ahead and figure out what m needs to be. And you can skip some steps here if you want to. see if you're a factoring champion or not. Can you factor this? I'll write it in this form, maybe that'll help you out. Any masters of algebra to factor this? Should be m minus a squared. So you can definitely foil this out, and you should be able to tell really quick that it's that uh, expanded version. This is also probably in the back of your algebra textbook, this factoring. They've used x's instead of m's, but I'm sure you've seen this before. All right, so m equals a, and it's repeated twice. So we just saw that I can't take e to the ax twice because it won't. The second one won't be independent. So I can't. I know one of them is certainly e to the ax, but I can't have the second one be the same thing. So I'll just go y1 is e to the ax and y2 equals something different. Alright, so how different? Let's uh, let's just let y2 equal something. This something is some function of x times e to the ax. Now right away, this function, if this function is constant, it's going to be the exact same solution we got the first time around. So I need a function that's not constant this time that still works as a solution. So we're going to do is we're going to plug this into the original? Yes. All right. So f of x can't be constant because if so, we would get y2 equals some constant e to the ax, which then that's just basically the exact same thing as y1. You're not doing anything special. So that's why I can't go with a constant. So we're going to plug into the original, which is now at the top of the board. So I'll call the original asterisk. So we're going to plug in y2 into asterisk at the top. What do I have to do for the derivative of y2? What rule do I have to use? Got to use product rule. This is not constant multiple rule. And the second derivative is going to be a significant pain because I got two product rules to worry about.
think I get two of those middle terms on my second derivative. That was as much algebra as I could do, I think, in terms of factoring. All right, now we're going to plug this in. Maybe I clean up. Yeah, I'll clean up y2 prime by factoring out e to the ax also. So we got f prime plus af. And I'll rewrite y2 in this same form, so it's e to the ax times just f. So I'm using all these, I'll circle them in blue. So those, those are the versions I'm going to be plugging in, just because I've done a bunch of algebra to them already. So I'll write out the ODE and then we'll plug them all in. So we got y double prime minus 2ay prime plus a squared y is 0. So y double prime is the one at the bottom, e to the ax, f prime prime plus 2af prime plus a squared f minus 2a e to the ax times f prime plus a f and last up a squared e to the ax f all this equals zero so every term has e to the ax so we'll just divide by e to the ax canceling it all out those can be canceled. And now we'll just try to group similar terms. Hopefully we'll get a nice, we do have to distribute right here as well. So we get f prime plus 2a, f double prime plus 2af prime plus a squared f minus 2af prime minus 2a squared f plus a squared f equals zero. So we should get some significant cancellations. So I'm using the green pen to cancel out my f terms. All right, so my green cancellations I think are good. Now we'll move on to the a to the first power term. I think those just straight cancel out. Yeah, so those two completely cancel. Oh, look at that. Second derivative equals zero. So that tells me quite a bit about the f function. So I know it's not constant, and I know the second derivative is zero. If you know the second derivative is zero, what would the third derivative equal? Zero. So all the other derivatives are zero. What kind of function is not constant and has a second derivative of zero, meaning it has no concavity? So if you think about the graph, it's not happy and it's also not sad. It's linear. It's only one type of function that has no curve to it and is not constant. And that's a line, not a horizontal line. So a horizontal line would have a zero slope, would be constant. So we need a line that's not horizontal, so it's going to have some slope to it. So I can write down right away, there's only one choice for f. So only possibility. Don't use a, don't use m. I think we use b. Dx plus, I don't want to use C. 
D's out, E's out, E's really out. F, G, G's always a function, K. All right. <laughs> Run out of letters quick. All right, so you can see right away a second derivative will be zero. It's not constant as long as what condition satisfied. What would make, what type of B and or K values would make this constant? Yeah, make sure you don't have a zero slope and you'll be okay. All right, so let's take this back to uh, where we created F. So I'm gonna way up here. All right, so Y2, here we go. Y2 equals F of X E to the AX. So let's rewrite that. This is the main reason I didn't want to use A a second time. I would be using A completely different uh, purposes. All right, so that's Y2, BX plus K, E to the AX. I'm just going to rewrite Y1 was just E to the AX. So let's go ahead and add these two together. So YC is going to be C1, E to the AX plus C2, uh, oh, C2, BX plus K, E to the AX. Do we actually have three independent, linearly independent functions here? Look at the first and last part. So I can rewrite this as C1 plus C2K e to the ax. This C1 plus C2K, that's the new constant that I just circled right there. So we actually only have two independent functions. That last part right there is dependent with the first. So what we're going to do to fix this, what I just circled, we'll just call that a different constant. And what I just circled a second time is another constant. Take our YC to equal, let's do, I use B with subscript. So I'll go B1 E to the AX plus B2 X E to the AX. This is going to be our linear combination of independent solutions right here. So what I did was repeated twice. What do you think it would look like if A was repeated thrice? We would do this again, but think about this pattern. What do you think then? It would be a quadratic, so I would get a B3 X squared E to the A X. So basically just bump the power up for every repeat you get. So that's the pattern that happens right here. Uh, to properly do this, I would have to, somewhere up here, write the equivalent uh, third degree linear OD with constant coefficients that had, a that had a repeated solution of A three times. So if I was going to prove this, I would start out by doing M minus A cubed and then turn it into the ODE that I would get and go ahead and solve it that way. But I don't really need to do that. I'm just going to say it works and just go for it. Because even if I did three, I'd have to do four, five, six, etc., and then do some type of inductive proof to say, um, you know, if it works for n, it works for n plus one repeats. So class is over, we gotta run, but I'll write the uh, the method down for in general, what I just described. I'll write it down uh, next class. 
And then we'll get into complex roots, which gets a little more tricky. And we'll get into some cool complex um, geometry.